Praise the Lord. Amen. You appreciate Darren and his uh, improvised worship team this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. It's tough when everybody goes away the same weekend, isn't it? Hallelujah. Praise God for talented individuals. Amen. If you got a Bible, grab it, open it up to Luke chapter 20. Luke 20. Working our way still through Luke's gospel on Sunday mornings. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 20, if you don't have a Bible, grab the bulletin, it's got it in there as well. Beginning at verse 41 this morning, we're going to jump right into it. So Luke records the words of Jesus here, it says, but he said to them, verse 41, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in robes and love greetings in the marketplace and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Underline that last two words, greater condemnation. We're going to pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for speaking to our hearts, Lord, through worship and praise. And Lord, your Holy Spirit's presence among us, Lord God. And Father, now we ask that you would take your word, Lord, and you would, you would place it deep within our spirit, Lord God, that you would plant seeds of life in us that would bloom and grow and produce fruit, Lord God, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And we believe you'll do it in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's my, here's my statement that I want you to get, all right? Because this is going to go cross-grain against a lot of things that you've heard, maybe. You ready? Yes, Pastor? Yes. All right. Uh, come on, I'm going to keep you awake. Some sins are greater than others, and some sinners are greater than others. And we got a, we got a culture, a Christian culture, you know, kind of a, what I call a pop culture, popular Christianity just says, well, you know, all sins the same in the sight of God and all those things. And that's just not true biblically. It's not true. So I want to dispel that this morning. You, you underlined a couple of words there, the last couple words, greater condemnation, greater, say that word, greater greater. I, got, I titled this message, Greater Sins. So I want to spend a few minutes on this, and I want us to get this, because honestly, to tell you the truth, this is an incredibly important message. This, is, this, this could be a life changer, a game changer for you if you're here this morning, and you're struggling with anything. I want you to, I want you to just hang on. It's not going to be one of those, oh yeah, amen, oh preach it, brother, <laughs> messages. It's not going to be, you're not going to be happy with me for the first 30, for first 30 minutes of this sermon. You'll like the ending, I hope. But you're not going to be all that happy along the way here. But you, I want you to listen. I want you to really listen to me this morning. So the Westminster Larger Catechism, which is a teaching tool, a document that was written way back in the 1600s. In the 1600s, it was a document written to teach Christians about Christianity. It's, in, it's, it's held huge influence over people's lives over the centuries. Four centuries ago it was written. Just, just absolutely as true then as it is now. It states a principle that is rarely expressed in our age of relativism and fuzzy thinking. Namely, that the same sin, listen, the same sin may be more terrible when committed by one person than another. Even the same sin. 
may be more terrible when committed by one person than another. This is going to, like I told you, it's going to go against all that you thought. I mean, we live in an age where sin is, it's trivialized, it's minimized, it's rationalized, it's underemphasized, it's oftentimes legitimized, and oftentimes it's even glamorized. So here, the old catechisms, these ones that were written hundreds of years ago, were all written by, as, a, as a question and then a biblical answer. So there was a question and, and then an answer. So question 150 in the larger catechism says, are all transgressions of the law of God equally heinous in themselves and in the sight of God? Answer, all transgressions of the law of God are not equally heinous, but some sins in themselves and by reason of several aggravations are more heinous in the sight of God than others. We just have this idea that every sin is equal, and it's really not biblically true. Let me just give you a few examples of scripture to get you oriented to the facts of what I'm trying to say to you. You're going to have to listen this morning because I'm going to teach this morning, all right? This is not preaching. John 19, 11, Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So somebody had a greater sin than somebody else. Even though they both gave Jesus up to crucifixion, some had a greater sin than others. He's talking about the Jews had a greater sin than Pilate because Pilate didn't grow up in church. Ezekiel 8, 6 says, And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here? I'm just giving you examples to get you oriented to the idea that some sins are greater than others. Are you with me? To drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will see still greater abominations, worse sins. This is God talking. So we know that God is true. Let every man be a liar. God is true, right? 1 John 5, 16, if, everyone, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. So there's obviously a, a lesser sin and a greater sin there. One of them, and he says, don't even pray about it. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, flee sexual immorality every other sin. So there's a comparison drawn. A person commits his outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Right? Are you with me? So the Westminster Catechism is telling us, and the Bible is telling us, that there are greater sins than others. And that one person can commit the same sin and it's worse for one person than it is for the other person. Now, we're going to we're gonna have to work this for a, minute, a couple of minutes, all right? Because that you, that's going against everything that you've always heard. Let's go. I, I, I'm, I'm going to let it sink in as I'm, as I'm going. I'm going to go slow because I want you to get this. All right? And I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to prove it. So question 151, the next question in the catechism says, what are those aggravations that make some sins more heinous than others? And here's the fourfold answer that they give. You with me? You, pay, you paying attention okay? I know it's a rainy day and your, your brain is cloudy and foggy and but I, I, th this is really important stuff. Listen, this is really important stuff. So number one, some sins are more heinous than others due to the advantages of the offenders. If they be of riper age, greater experience of grace, eminent for profession, gifts, place, offices, guides to others, and whose example is likely to be followed by others, their sins are more terrible. Secondly, the second aggravation they list is some sins are more heinous than others due to the parties they directly offend. 
blasphemy of God is heinous, but also sins against any of the saints, particularly weak brethren, the souls of them or any other, and the common good of all or many are particularly heinous sins. Third one, some sins are more heinous than others due to the nature and quality of the sin. That is, if the sin is committed while fully knowing God's graces and requirements and yet doing it anyway while admitting no guilt or fault. They're worse than others. Number four, some sins are more heinous than others due to the circumstances of time and place, if in public or in the presence of others who are thereby likely to be provoked or defiled. So basically, to summarize that, that, kinda, that, an, that answer and that idea that we're talking about, these four things. Number one, the longer and therefore greater experiences of grace make, us, make something greater. In other words, if you grow up in church and you hear the Bible all your life, you go to Sunday school, you have all those advantages, you have all that light, you have all that truth poured into you, you have good parents, and then you go out and, and commit sin, whether it's moral sin, whether it's uh, get involved in drugs or alcohol or sexual immorality. Or, that, those sins are far more heinous than a kid who grew up on the streets of Chicago, never heard the word of God. Not that, not, not that it wouldn't be sin for him too, but it's not as great a sin. So I told you it's going to go against all that you th- you've ever thought, but I'm telling you the truth. Let me explain how Jesus describes this. Here's the words of Jesus talking about this issue. You ready? All that a servant, and and that servant who knew his master's will, this is out of Luke's gospel as well, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. There's greater punishment for greater sin. That's what he's saying. He's saying people who knew God's will and purposely sinned against it sinned in a greater way and will receive greater punishment. Right? You with me? I'm telling you, listen, this ought to crush most of us in this room. The truth I'm giving you this morning ought to pretty much crush most of us this morning. If it's not crushing you, I'm going to pray for you. Because it really, it's... So Jesus goes on. So the one who knew gets a severe beating. The one who didn't know gets a light beating. Then he says, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And to from, from whom they entrusted much, they will demand more. The greater light that we've had... The more truth we've had, the more exposure to the Bible, the more uh, input we've had from parents or friends or family. When we sin, the more light that we've had, the greater the responsibility. The greater the responsibility means the greater the culpability or liability, the guilt. We simply just love to say that all sins are the same to God. It's just not biblically accurate. It's not biblically accurate. So why am I saying this? Am I trying to heap on guilt on you? And am I trying to make you feel bad? Am I trying to be legalistic? Absolutely not. But I want to I keep going with this thought for a minute because we're going to get to this text because this text is, is all about this because he tells these, these scribes, he says, you guys are guilty of greater condemnation. I, I'm, I'm giving you the, the truth behind what Jesus said is this whole principle. So if we don't understand the nature of God and we don't understand the nature of our sin, it will produce in us a superficial repentance and enable us to falsely feel good about ourselves and casually or flippantly deal with sin in our lives. Hello? 
the modern day typical response, not only outside the church, but inside the church is this. Oops, oh, I screwed up, Lord, forgive me. And not another thought about it. We call it the hyper grace doctrine, which is not true. It's not accurate. It's false. It's a false way of looking at When no brokenness occurs, then there's no radical surgery to excise out the spiritual cancer that has damaged our soul. And the only way that we're going to be broken enough to repent wisely, deeply enough, is when we understand the depth of our sin. That means we have to take into account how much light we've had. Because if we've sinned in greater ways because we've had greater light, then we're far more responsible. And, it, and, it, and that, that requires in and of itself a far deeper brokenness and deeper repentance. I told you you wouldn't be shouting. Probably don't even like me now. I don't really care, but you know. Because unless sin is dealt with at the deepest level, and it's deeper and worse in people who've had more light and sinned against that light. Unless it's dealt with at a deeper level, it never gets the garbage out of our soul. Amen. This isn't a a cup, it's a bottle, but let's just say, let's just say I've got this bottle filled with Nasty, disgusting, soured, curdled, moldy, gross milk. Okay? And I'm going to, I don't want to drink that, obviously, right? Because that's, we, we all get that. So, I think to myself, it's not that bad. So I pour out all of it, but I leave about a half an inch in the bottom. And then I pour in sparkling spring water. Anybody here want to drink it then? It's still putrid. It's still polluted. It's still nasty. It's still gross. And it'll still make you sick. Right? Because what what was the problem? It wasn't that I didn't pour out most of this stuff. The problem was I didn't pour out all of this stuff. And I didn't get a cleansing inside the, the... Even if I poured it all out, there would still be a film in there. And if I didn't wash it thoroughly, right, and cleanse it, I'd still have all the same germs and they'd breed right in that water and it would just be the same thing all over again. Are you with me? This is one of the most critical issues for for believers because believers are oftentimes deluding themselves into thinking that, oh, oh, yeah, I blew it. I made a mistake. And I go on. And there's no brokenness and there's no depth of repentance and there's no sorrow and and, and there's no dealing with the actual core of the sin. We've been talking a lot about this at Overcomers class. About 20 guys going through that, hearing it getting it it's powerful i need to get all of that out the only way i'm going to get it out is if i actually recognize and i allow the convicting work there is there's there's no shortcuts to forgiveness are you with me there's no fast track to getting through Sin. There's only God's way, and that's it. He's the only one who can forgive sin. He's the only one who can deal with sin. He's the only one who can take away sin. He's the only one who can get to the very depth of our soul, but only if we let him. It kind of breaks my heart nowadays because I I just, it's hard to see people really broken over their sin. It just isn't happening like it should be in people's lives. They're just in a hurry to move on, get past it, 
get to the good things. And I got to tell you, without this, there will never be a getting to the good things. That's why I told you at the end you like it, because the, the fact of the matter is, is, is the, the only way I'm going to really enjoy a good bottle of water is if I get that thing cleaned out. In fact, they just, they just got done doing a study on water bottles. I don't know if you ever saw it, but they did a study on water bottles, and it was disgusting. Just reusable water bottles and the germs, just, just the germs from just using the bottle and not scrubbing it. It was gross. And we got our lives and we keep walking along and we keep hoping that we'll, things will get better, but oftentimes we just have not dealt with sin in our life. And we haven't brought it to the Lord. We haven't allowed him to cleanse us. We haven't allowed ourselves to be broken. And this goes for any kind of sin. Whether it's an an action or an attitude or whatever. Listen to how how the Bible describes people that are going through the process of what I'm describing to you. This this realizing their sin and, and feeling the weight of it and dealing with it in their internal life, in their soul. Listen, listen, these are, this, this is Bible. You ready? Oh, Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath, for arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There's no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There's no health in my bones because of my sin. This is out of the heart of a man after God's own heart. For my iniquities have gone over my head. What do you mean? mean? I'm drowning in sin, Lord. Like a heavy burden, they're too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I'm utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day I go about mourning for my sides are filled with burning and there's no soundness in my flesh. I'm feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. Oh, Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, it's gone. That's one of a bunch of different recordings of the struggles in the soul. But that's that's what God is looking for. He wants us to wrestle with our sin, with him. He wants us to feel the weight of it so that we come to him in brokenness so that he can empty us out completely and we understand how much we need to be empty, how badly we need to get everything out. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. We love this passage, but it's pretty brutal if you read it. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. I can't get it out of my mind. I can't get past it. God, it's killing me. Against you, and you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. This is David after his sin with Bathsheba committing adultery and then murder to cover it up. And even in the midst of this, I was thinking about this this morning and don't don't think I'm a heretic, but listen, even, even in this, David was still minimizing this to some degree. Even as agonizing as this is, it, was, it still needed more. Look what he said. Against you and you only have I sinned. He committed adultery with a woman. He killed a man. He didn't, he didn't sin just against God. Yes, first and foremost, he sinned against God. He sinned against her. He sinned against him. He sinned against that baby. He sinned against the nation that he was leading in God's name. He sinned all the way around. The sin it was a huge circle. He he brought a blot on God's name in Israel. I mean, the scope of sin needs to be fully accounted for so that there's a corresponding brokenness 
and a corresponding repentance and sorrow for that sin so that God can truly do a vast scope of cleansing, healing, and restoring. Hope you're with me. Are you still with me? Right? Behold, he still goes on. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. God, I've got to come clean. I've got to be honest. And you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Create in me a clean heart. Cast me not away from your presence and please, God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The threat was very real that that was going to be the case. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, right? The Living Bible says, one of these verses says, for I admit my shameful deed, it haunts me day and night. God, I recognize what's going on. You can say, well, that's Old Testament. Let's go to the New Testament. Peter, outside of the courtyard where Jesus is being tried, and he's being accused of knowing Jesus, and he's saying, no, I didn't know Jesus. I don't know who he is. He's denying Christ. Here's a man who had light. He'd walked with Jesus for three years. He, had, he not only had light, he, had the, he, he, he touched the light. He walked with the light. He handled the light. Jesus had been with him for three years. They'd been walking together. In fact, the night before, Jesus had, Peter had said, I'll never deny you. And then there he is the next day denying him against all the light he had. And it says as Peter was finishing up his denials, that Jesus, in Luke's gospel, it tells us that Jesus looked across the courtyard and looked into the eyes of Peter. And it says Peter went out and he wept bitterly. That's, the, that's a hugely descriptive term. He went out there and he was crushed. He fell apart. All the weight of what he had done, all the, all the horrible, heinous sin that he had just committed in just those few words fell on him like a ton of bricks. Like a ton of bricks. And he couldn't get over it. It, it. Jesus had to come to him later, we know, and restore him down the road after the resurrection. It pretty much wrecked Peter. Are you with me? The point here is that if, if we know better, we can't simply just fall back on, on the idea, well, I'm only human. Instead, we have to fall back. There is a fallback. The fallback is, on, is throwing ourselves on the mercy of God in brokenness and repentance. We cannot minimize. I want you to listen to one of these testimonies. This is a guy's testimony that was talking about kind of this whole concept that I'm sharing this morning. He says, for years I was Mr. Minimizer. The guy who thinks his sinful lifestyle isn't really that big a deal. Consumed with pleasing only myself, I was steeped in denial and adept at shifting blame. So despite the obvious far-reaching consequences of my sin, the art of minimizing became my mantra. My hardened heart was quick to excuse my sin, saying, it's no big deal, or I can deal with that later. When relatives or others confronted me about how selfish I was being, it was not unusual for me to lash out in anger or shut down in stubborn silence, preferring instead to shine a spotlight on areas where I thought I was doing well. Let's, let's divert things. But he says, but as the scripture plainly teaches, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. He goes on to say, here in this passage from God's word was the path to true freedom over my life-dominating sinful habits. But as long as I steadfastly resisted this path, nothing could happen for me. 
So long as I continue to essentially deny my sinful, my sinful behavior by trivializing it, real change was virtually impossible. God was willing to purify me, but I was unwilling to confess and acknowledge that my sin was indeed sin. Thankfully, one day after some time of despair, due to my bondage and failure, the Lord finally rescued me, broke through to my hard heart, and granted me the gift of repentance. When the light and truth of his word pierced my darkened soul, the verdict was clear. Guilty is charged, and there's no one else to blame. Finally humbled, my approach to God's throne of grace was littered with an extensive list of sins, bad attitudes, and past failures. At last, my sin was finally a big deal. I knew I couldn't ignore the guilt and the shame of it any longer. Looking back over my life, the proverb had been fulfilled. He who covers his sins will not prosper. But I was determined to latch onto the promise contained in the second part of that verse, which says, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. No brokenness, no, no realization of our sin, no healing, no restoration. No complete work of God in our lives. This is what Jesus was addressing in these religious leaders that day. We get all well, we, we all probably should get pretty easily the, the application of all those truths. Because we all know we all fail, right? Whether we admit it or not, whether we confess it or not, whether we're convicted of it or not, that's another story. Right? So Jesus comes to these religious leaders here, and they're, they're, they're in a bad way in a couple of ways. And there's, there's two little paragraphs here that basically explain two things that they're doing wrong, two, two ways that they're really sinning against the Lord. Because they had so much light. Because they had so much light. Th- these. These guys that he's going to address here, here's the thing. They're called teachers of the law or scribes, right? They're they're the ones who are supposed to know. Jeremiah, who's a historical writer of long ago, told us what these guys were like. The scribes, they're biblical scholars. One could always recognize a scribe because... He wore a white linen robe with a long white fringe that reached to his feet. They were religious power dressers. Ecclesiastical swans regally gliding among the mud hens of common humanity. In his book, Jerusalem, in the time of Jesus, he says that all people rose respectfully when a scribe passed by. And that only tradesmen busy at their work were exempt. They were, they were great, greeted respectfully as rabbi, which means my great one, or master, or father. When the wealthy gave feasts, scribes were considered necessary ornaments to adorn the meal. They were always given a place of honor, reclining to the right or the left of the host. The teachers of the law were honored above the aged, even above their own parents. When they came to the synagogue, they sat in the place of ultimate honor, facing the congregation with their backs against the chest that held God's law, the Torah, so all could see how really pious they were. How really pious they were. And so he addresses them in verse 41, but he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? I'm not going to spend all day telling you how, why these scribes should absolutely have known what that text meant. But they absolutely should have known what that text meant. The problem was they didn't want to know what it meant. They wanted it to mean what they wanted it to mean. And so in doing so, they were sinning against all the light that they had. This is the, that text that Jesus is quoting here is, the mo, is one of the most quoted Old Testament passages in the New Testament. And every Jewish scholar and every New Testament writer, they all know it had to do with the Messiah. 
They all knew that it had to teach that he was not just human, but also divine. But these guys had their own agenda. They wanted to look at the Bible their way. We still have people today that want to look at the Bible their way. Well, I don't believe that's what the Bible says. Usually, the reason that happens is because they haven't done what we just got done talking about. Allowing God to shine his spotlight on their sin so that they could understand what God's will really was. And that's what was going on in these guys' lives. They took the Bible and they just twisted it around, made it mean what they wanted to mean. And of course, they were incorrect, right? So as believers in Christ, I mean, here's a couple of, these are a couple of examples. All the things we're, that we talked about already apply to every kind of sin and every kind of situation. But here Jesus is going to address these couple specific ones. Let's just focus on them just for a minute. So how do you read the Bible? How do you read the Bible? Do you read it to find cool things so that you can feel good about yourself? Do you read it to support whatever lifestyle you want to live? I'm just asking. Do you read it to to find support for how, how I want to live? Do you read it so you have an impressive storehouse of knowledge? That you're informationally rich? Do you read it to find promises that can apply to your life, basically by ripping them out of context, that even though you may be walking in direct disobedience to God, you still want to claim them? Come on, I'm just asking. Hello? Or do you read the Bible to truly discover God's will and his ways so that you can say, God, whatever you, I'll submit to whatever your truth declares to me. I'll obey it, I'll believe it, and I will will walk in it, no matter how much it hurts. That's what I want, Lord. That's what I want. One writer says, the problem with these teachers of the law is that they had studied, they had a studied ignorance of God's word and a practiced inability to think beyond rabbinical traditions. They wanted to see the Bible the way they wanted to see the Bible, and that was all they were going to see which was a wicked sin. And it's still a wicked sin today. You say, well, you know, I, I'm just human. I don't really always understand everything. You know, well, we have everything. We have the resources around us. We have way too much light for us to use ignorant phrases or ignorant excuses. They want to say that they, re- they read the word through a political lens that, per- that reduced the Messiah to a mere man like David. We do the same thing with our lenses, an economic lens that turns every scripture into advice for financial well-being. A racial lens that not too long ago edited out the scriptural teaching on ethnic equality. A feminist lens that interprets and rejects the scriptures as a tract for patriarchal dominance. A postmodern lens that subjectivizes the Holy Scripture into, well, this is what it means to me. We all have our lenses, and our lenses blind us to the glory of God's word. We must try to read God's word for what it is and seek the Holy Spirit's help. Amen? Amen. That's the, that's the truth. That's the truth. William Willimon, he he's, teaches at Duke. I mean, Duke's like a super liberal place, but William Willimon is a, a believing evangelical. And he said this in an article. He, this article says, Ben there preached that, is the name of the article. But listen to what he says. He, he, he really zeroes in here. Do you know how disillusioning it has been for me to realize that many of these self-proclaimed biblical preachers now sound more like liberal mainliners than liberal mainliners do? These, quote, biblical preachers were becoming user-friendly and inclusive, taking their preaching cues from the felt needs of us baby boomers and busters rather than the excruciating demands of the Bible. 
I know why they do this. After all, we mainline liberal experiential expressionists played this game before the conservative evangelical reformed orthodox got there. Reducing salvation to self-esteem, sin to maladjustment, church to group therapy, and Jesus to dear Abby. This is our chief means of perverting the Bible. And pop Christianity plays right into that sometimes. We got to be careful. We got to be careful that we don't minimize, trivialize, and do things with sin that shouldn't be done. What needs to be done with sin? Confession, repentance, brokenness. All the way down to our toes. All the way down to our toes. Because only then can God get us thoroughly clean so that we can be thoroughly restored. I mean, the, the, the will of God in that is so clear. He wants us to be totally restored, totally redeemed, totally healed, totally whole. But it doesn't happen unless we totally confess, forsake, repent, and are broken over our own sin. Then Jesus addresses these, these guys again. He says, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in their long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, best seats in the synagogues, places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses for a pretense or to make a show, and long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. These guys, they took their place of influence, their place of their position, all that they could have been and should have been, and they took that and they abused it, knowing better, having plenty of light, the Old Testament, they only had the Old Testament at that time, but the Old Testament was absolutely clear on how to treat widows or the, or the orphans or the poor or those who are disadvantaged socially, all those different ways. They're, it's clearly spelled out in Scripture. Listen, you are a child of the living king if you belong to Jesus today. You are a royal priest to the holy nation. If you take that advantage and you misuse it, you are guilty of the greater sin. We would be guilty of the greater sin if we take all the advantages that the Lord has given us and we forget all the other ethical concerns that God has in his heart for human beings. We sin greatly against God. If we don't walk in compassion, if we don't walk in humility towards other people, we've missed it totally. And because we have more light, we will be more responsible. And because we're more responsible, we will be more culpable. Are you with me? You get what we're saying today? Only walking in the light is what's going to produce what God wants. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1, 7, then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus, his son, keeps on cleansing us from sin. That means the more I learn, the more I know about God, the more I'm going to know about my own sin. The more I know about my own sin, the more broken and repentant I need to become so that I can walk in the light and I can receive the cleansing by the power of the blood of Jesus so that Jesus can continue to wash me and purge me and make me whole and restore me and fix the things that are broken in my life because of sin. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we just come in Jesus' name. Very tough message this morning, Lord. Hard but true statements. Father, before we even move from this moment, just right now, Lord, would you just make this a sacred altar? If you're here this morning and you're in sin, any kind of sin, 
Right now is the time to let the Holy Spirit come and wash over you and to bring conviction into your soul. You can make excuses, you can rationalize, you can minimize, you can trivialize, you can say whatever you want, you can say, oh, that's just old-fashioned Bible thumping. You can say whatever you want, but it's God's word. And every person is going to give an answer to God for what they know of his word. If you're here this morning, this is a sacred moment. This is the moment. If you're struggling with sin, if, you, if you're involved in sin, if you've been involved in sin, if you've never, maybe you've got sins that you really never even confessed from the past. I know nobody, in, nobody wants to be embarrassed. Nobody wants to, listen, it's a lot more important that you have a clean soul and spend eternity in heaven Than, you, than suffering a little embarrassment. Or God is serious about this. And we need to be as well. If there's something in your life right now is the time to let it out. Call on God right now. I'm just going to give you a couple of moments. Right where you're at, I want you to just call. I want you to call on the Lord right now. Right where you're at, I want you to call on the Lord right now. Say, God, I'm so sorry for minimalizing my sin. I'm so sorry for rationalizing it and trivializing it. Legitimizing it. I need cleansing, and so I want to be emptied. The only way I can be empty, Lord, is to pour myself out to you and truly repent. Turn away from what I'm doing. Turn around. Stop thinking the way I've been thinking. My thinking's been skewed. Hasn't been right. I've been thinking my way, not your way, even about sin, though I know it's wrong. Jesus. 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 Break our hearts for what breaks yours, Lord. We sing that song, break our heart for what breaks yours. Break our hearts. For what breaks yours? Because it's not about just thinking about this or that or rules or regulations. It's about a relationship with you, Lord. It's about being in love with you, being able to look you in the eyes. without guilt or fear or condemnation because we've truly let you deal with our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm purposely taking time. I just want you to be able to work with the Holy Spirit in this moment. I want him to be able to work with you. I want him to be able to have his way. I know we don't have Karen up here to sing some special song. I want the Holy Spirit to sing a special song in your soul this morning. I'm going to close in prayer.
If you need to spend some time praying at this altar, it's open. If you're going to be noisy in fellowship, which is fine, I'm, that's great. We want to fellowship. T- please take it out in the foyer. So if anybody wants to be here at the altar, they can be. I just believe the Lord wants to de- do some dealing with hearts this morning. And if your heart is in that place, don't walk out of these doors without letting God do what he wants to do. Don't do it. I'm telling you, don't do it. Come and spend it however long you need to spend just working through whatever is in your heart with the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you that you love us enough to tell us the truth. Lord, you love us enough, Lord, to not let us just go on kidding ourselves, deceiving ourselves, hoping that something good's going to happen when, we, when there's still stuff bad happening inside of our hearts, Lord, or our lives. Touch every heart in this place. Lord, and do a work as deep as is necessary in every soul. We yield ourselves to you. Bless your people throughout this week, Lord God. Maybe this will all catch up with somebody on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday and They're going to need to get down beside their bed, Father, and just cry out to you. Lord, may it be so. May it be so. Father, like I prayed at the beginning of of the message, Lord, that this seed would be planted in us and and bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. That's still my prayer, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.